Thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, let's see. Let's see, before I start, I want to let you know to not forget to provide feedback by filling out the short surveys that, you'll, that they'll be passing out. Most of you are sitting on the edge, and that means you're going to try to escape if it's a boring talk. So I'll try not to, not to make it boring. I've sat through many of these conferences myself. So um, how many of you uh, were at the keynote and heard me talking a little bit about I like? A couple of you? Oh, good. And how many of you are, are working at startups right now? Cool. And under 10 people startups? Oh, wow, that's awesome. OK. So um, I'm going to give a quick blurb about what I like is. We're, we were a small startup. Um, we're now about 30 people. We're mostly engineers in Seattle. We have almost 27 million users across our own website, ilike.com, High Five Orchid and MySpace, Facebook, Bebo. Um, High Five Orchid and MySpace, of course, are open social apps. Facebook and Bebo, um, Bebo will someday be an open social app. Bebo's right now a Facebook um, API platform partner. I think they're going to do both. I, whatever works for me. Um, we, have, we run our own data center. Um, we have about 200 servers and 60, data, 60 of those are, are databases. Um, our traffic peaks daily in the 140 to 200,000 hits a minute range. We run Ru Ruby on Rails almost completely. How many Ruby on Rails apps, startups? Smaller number. OK. Well, that's all right. I, I don't hold it against you. Um, we use a product called a Zeus ZXTM load balancer, which is purely because it's such a cool name. You have to use a product like that. Um, we run that load balancer in front of um, Apache and a, a layer called Mod Proxy Balancer. And then we have about 30 to 100 mongrel threads on, on each one of our nodes. So that's about as much about I like as I'm going to say. I mean, I like is a, a social um, music features. They're features about letting people find music and share music with their friends. Um, if, you, if you haven't tried the app, you can go to ilike.com and try it out, or you can try it out on Facebook. The thing to, the thing to recognize about it is, is that it's, it's got a pretty heavy combination of what we call profile pages, profile boxes, and home boxes, and canvas pages. Um, in that respect, I call what we do sort of a deep app. We are both kind of in your face with sort of interesting cutesy features like dedicate a song to your friends and attach an icon to it like I showed in the, um, in the keynote presentation. But we also are sort of a, a deeper, broader app where, we, where if you have an artist you're interested in, you can say, I like this application, or I like this artist. And you can say, I want to receive notifications about when this artist is in town. So we have a whole bunch of back end infrastructure about finding out what artists you like and pumping that information through you through your social network. Um, so that's about all I wanted to say about that. Um, when th there's a couple general things that we do um, that have to do with scale that if you're a small, if you're a small startup and you're thinking about getting into the uh, social networking world, that it's worth just laying your foundation or making sure the framework that you're using has this kind of cooked into it. And those are um, a master-slave architecture, um, the ability to partition your database into chunks, um, database connection pooling, um, memcache support. Um, and we have a couple other things that, that we've added to the list that we think are, are sort of important. So I'm going to talk about a couple of these a little bit. These will make some sense to, to Ruby developers. They might make some sense. They're kind of custom to us. They're things that we hope to someday push back into, the, um, into Rails. Um, but they are, we have this very simple ability. I'm going to wave my cursor, maybe. Yeah, here it is, waving around. I'm going to wave my cursor around here. We have um, this way to specify that a, a model, which is a, a piece of code that represents backend database uh, schema. We have a way of, of saying that this model runs purely from the master database. That is, reads and writes from this, from this model occur only to the master database. Um, and there may or may not be a, a caching layer, a memcache layer between us and the database. But fundamentally, the reads and the writes are going to the master database. Um, and, and one of the things that means, by the way, is if I did a write, then guaranteed a read is going to come uh, from, the, from the master, and it's going to have whatever I just wrote. Whereas this other type of, of, of connection where we say, um, and in Ruby language, what this means is that class bar, so I have a model called bar, and it inherits from, from, um, from a class, a, a base class called I like DB. And that means that this is a master, a, a master slave database. And that means that sometimes 
if I write something to this model and, I, and then I read it later, I might not actually get what I wrote. And why that is is because that there can be replication lag. There can be a time delay between when data is written to the master and what I read from the slave. So these constructs look pretty simple. Um, they're, they're things that are super duper important to have if you're, if you're building something like this um, uh, from, from scratch. Another piece of this is that's very similar. Oh, I should, I should say I, I gave two examples and I'd like to talk about them. Um, this, is, this is how we kind of change the way that we do certain operations. So instead of just saying the class bar find, we would say if we're using this class bar that is a master-slave database, but we really want to read from the master, for example, if I just wrote something, to, if, I just, if a user just posted something to a wall and I really want to show that exact thing that they just wrote, but if I read from the slave it might not be there, I, I can pass in this symbol master and it will force that read to go up there. Um, I can also use a block, which is sort of a Ruby thing, which is really cool if you, if you like that sort of geeking out. Um, uh, this other piece that I, I describe here is database partitioning where um, when you get to the scale of having 60 databases, you can't just have 60 complete copies of a terabyte of data that is replicating at a rate of a, of a gigabyte every two hours. You can't just have 60 copies of that. There's not enough disk spindles to do that. So what you end up doing is partitioning your data up into chunks and having multiple masters and multiple slave sets. And so this example that I get for us is we have a partition set called a wall database. And this is a subset of tables from, from our main master database, or one of our master databases, that just carries these posts on walls that we want to render for users. And when we need to read those, we have a small set of slave databases that we just read from those guys. Um, so if you're, if you're serious about <laughs> building a big application, if you're using PHP or if you're using Ruby or whatever you're using, these constructs that I'm describing if you don't have them, you should invest in those first. We invested in some of them first, and we invested in more of them later. I, um, they're, they're super important to invest in, and if, you, if they don't make sense, um, it's worth reading about database sharding and database partitioning and a couple other things uh, out, out on the net if you want to really grow big. Another thing that I'm going to repeat a couple times here, we're at a Google developer conference. Google solved a bunch of these problems for you. Like if you're on App Engine and you're reading and writing from Bigtable, you don't know anything about replication or slave lag or any of that crap at all. So that's, that's a good thing. So you might, you might consider the fact that even though you don't, you don't maybe particularly like uh, Python at the moment, which is what you have to use on, on App Engine right now, um, that A, they're going to change it to support other languages that you might like later, and, and B, there's a bunch of this crud that even though you can abstract it, it's still pretty complex for making a, high, uh, a very large-scale application. Um, Database connection pooling, that's a pretty standard piece of most, uh, most stacks. Um, this one other thing, if, if it's very specific, but it's a, there's, a, there's a mechanism that you find yourself doing if you're collecting huge quantities of user data. And in fact, I think this is a pretty useful thing even for um, if you're using App Engine. How many people here have tried App Engine or have gotten through yet? So not very many. So, it's definitely interesting to give that a try. Whether it's App Engine or it's any, anything else, if you're using a relational database of your own, one of the things that you struggle with if you have millions and millions of users, if you're collecting personal, uh, I, don't mean, I don't mean personal like private information, I mean information about that user, like they've told you what artists they like in our case, or if they're building a playlist. One of the things that, that we found was a, a classic database architecture, a classic schema of, for example, Let's say we wanted to store all the songs that a user has in a playlist. And let's say they have 25 playlists, and each of the, each of the playlists has, on average, um, 100 songs in it. So, so that's a lot. That's 2,500 unique pieces of information. And in a standard relational database, you might find yourself storing each of one of those in a row. And it might be, you know, here's the playlist ID, and here's the song ID, and here's the playlist ID, and here's the song ID, and here's the playlist ID, and here's the song ID. And you would repeat that. Um, 2,500 times. Um, what we found is when we're not, when there are pieces of information that we're not using consistently in a relational manner, if we find ourselves rolling up or doing group buys on something very, very consistently, that there's a, an extreme performance win, like 100x performance win in storing fewer rows. And the reason that I, I want to mention this 
whether you choose to use a relational database or whether you choose to use um, uh, App Engine and Bigtable, um, or even Memcache inside of, of App Engine, is unique elements always have, unique rows or unique keys always have overhead associated with them. So in App Engine, I don't think they've, they've said exactly what the row overhead is, but it's, let's say it's 20% overhead. Or in InnoDB, on MySQL, the row overhead is, is sometimes as much as, as 75 or 100% 100% overhead. So the fewer rows you can, you can generate, the, the happier you're gonna be uh, in the end. Um, let's see. Another thing that we do, which if you go in and read up on how Flickr scales or, or how uh, um, um, eBay scales, you'll find a lot of people talking about not using the relational database all that much to do relational things like joining stuff. They tend to do a lot of joining in their own code. Um, that's definitely something that, that we do too, although we do quite a bit more um, joining. We do a lot of what we call hydration, um, where we have whole swaths of the system that don't deal with strings at all. Let me, for us, our example is song. So every song that you've got out there has, a, has an artist name and a song title associated with it. And obviously I could have rows in the database that represent that and I could join you know, my track representation that points to an artist ID and it points to a, a track name ID and I could put that in a view or I could join all those things together. But what you find yourself doing is realizing that the, that the memory consumption of those joins occurring in the database and being transmitted in the way that they are is, is over the top. And so you find yourself manipulating a lot of just integers in the database and then you go out and hydrate those integers into strings from a partial database, a partial replica of data. And what you end up doing is getting a better working set footprint in your, in your databases to get that. So sorry to, to drill down super geeky for five minutes about sort of generic um, scaling, but if you're planning to go big, think about some of these things. Now, I'm, I'm gonna talk specifically, I hope, about, oh, you get to see what's happening on my desktop. Um, specifically for open social, are, are any of you writing open social apps already? Have you given it a try? There's a couple, a couple here. Um, one of the things that's different about open social versus Facebook, uh, and I like we're on Facebook as well as, as a lot of open social containers, is that we get a, a page view, we get a hit for profile pages and for home, home pages, um, as well as for Canvas pages. So um, as it turns out on social networks, uh, people spend a lot of time looking at each other's profile pages. And so what that translates into is a large number of, of um, page views for, for that content. So what that means is you need to think pretty hard about, um, uh, about caching those, and I'll talk about a couple things there. Um, so I mentioned here, they're, they're, the way Google designed open social and the way the open social community has been kind of feeding into the design of open social is that there's a lot more opportunity for you to uh, offload rendering down to the clients. Um, which is a very different programming style than if you're a classic web developer and you're used to kind of templates up on the server rendering down on the client and generating and, and kind of you know, ending up delivering HTML. If you're an Ajax programmer and you're used to kind of sending down JSON blobs and templatizing them up, then you're gonna be, you're gonna be in, in better shape with kind of the um, caching and performance for open social. Because in my mind, the system was a little bit more built towards this model, which is a little bit more the Gmail model, the Gmail Ajax model. Um, if you out there are starting from scratch or you're not too far into your project, um, I would definitely take a look at, at client-side rendering of templates, of HTML templates that you deliver. So you have some built-in, wired-in templates that are in your module spec, your open social gadget spec, and you fill that in from data from the server. So if your app is compatible with that style of rendering, if you're able to just render data down to the client and cache that data and then fill that data in with, with templates, that would, be a good, that would be a good plan. If I were starting from scratch and I didn't have my own standalone website, I like.com, and I did not have a Facebook application and I really just wanted to target open social, I would probably flip our projection model around a little bit and just project data down and fill in templates. Um, if you have existing web code, <laughs> like, like we do, um, you should really get medieval with caching. So 
we currently see 75% um, cache hit rate to our edge, to our load balancer, which is this um, Zixim. And clients tend to see about 80% cache um, because they're going through the, the proxy layer, um, the, the open social proxy. Um, until there are RESTful APIs to allow us or you as, as developers to allow your servers to communicate with the, the server proxy, the open social proxy for your container, and um, punch that cache, until that happens, um, we, ha we currently implement, and it's something that I would recommend you take a look at, implementing an out of bounds, um, that's what OOB stands for, out of bounds. Uh, it's not out of box, it's out of bounds. Um, we do an out of bounds JSONP call to our servers to pick up a cache key that we use to punch the cache. Um, and we put enormous cache expiries, like eight and 10 days, on these profile boxes so that users have a fast response time. Um, and my last point here is it, it says pretty much equal, equal to syndicating ilike.com modules. When we look at the cost of syndicating content to a third party site, if you've ever been to ask.com and you've searched for, for for somebody, I don't even know if I can do that here. Let's let's see if I'm I'm de um, adept enough at doing that. I think I've crashed a couple things. Um, but if you're on Ask.com and you and you search for U2, uh -huh, right? Um, there's this little module right here, which this is a syndication of our content content that we put on Ask.com in an iframe, which is. It's a statically sized iframe, but it's sort of like open social in that there's an iframe and it's content that we project out. Um, our, so in that slide that I gave where I said it's, it's somewhat equal, equal um, to syndicating ilike.com modules, basically anytime we had a module that we want to syndicate with a partner, we get pretty aggressive about caching that module um, so that it delivers quickly. So open social iframes are very, very similar to that. So you should be thinking in terms of, you know, always checking with wget what your cache headers are on your responses, making sure end to end that everything's punching correctly, and doing some things that I'm going to talk about. So I'm going to get a little bit more down to earth, um, or probably less down to earth, more into some code here for a second. Can I take a quick survey? Is is uh, is what we're talking about here roughly what you expected so far, or like woo random? Well, hands, a couple of hands say roughly what I expected. Okay, well, I, I am going to try to make sure there's time to ask questions because to me, as a, as a developer, I've been to a bajillion of these conferences over the years. To me, I'm more interested in, in kind of communication and I hear a lot of great questions. So I will, I will save a good chunk of time here at the end to, to talk about other stuff. So um, Another sort of baseline thing that you should be doing that, that may sound a little non-intuitive for scaling is that you should be doing analytics like crazy. So if you're not already using Google Analytics, you should. If you want to use something like Quancast, uh, you should do that too. The, um, you should use those things in such a way that you're, you're getting coarse information. Coarse information at scale is way more interesting than fine information. Um, like for us, we're way more interested in being able to see how many, excuse me, how many page views are Orkut, period, or Orkut slash artist pages than we are on how many page views Michael Jackson's page is getting. We don't use Google Analytics to keep track at the, at the level of Michael Jackson page views. We use Google Analytics to do course analysis of, you know, this section of our application, how many are we getting? How many search page hits do we get? How many artist page hits do we get? How many people are fiddling with their accounts? How many people are landing on dedication received or dedication sent pages? So it's very worthwhile thinking about your namespace, of, of your, your tag namespace, and cutting it up into reasonable pieces for coarse-grained analytics. W one, one thing about Google Analytics or Quantcast or almost any other product that I've seen, and that's why I'm going to drill into why it's worthwhile if you're serious about scale, that you should invest in your own analytics to a minor degree, and it's not complicated to do. Um, is because using some of the analytics sites is slow. They're, they're, they're dealing with a lot of your data, and the kinds of decisions you're trying to make to make your application grow or stay going are kind of quick. They're like, there was an outage, how many people are uninstalling? Or, or you know, the, the, the container was having a problem, or 
you know, there was a network connectivity problem. What's happening? You kind of want to know that information now. And knowing from the analytics engines what's happening every day, like as of midnight yesterday, is a little irritating. So I'll just tell you from experience, the daily stats are good for some things, and I'll talk about those, but it, it's, um, they can be a little bit coarse and they can be a little bit slow. Um, I think it's very important that there, if, you're, if you're doing a project and you want to grow on one of the social networks, you should try to create, um, you know, what you're trying to create is a dashboard of how you're doing, in my mind. And you're trying to create the smallest amount of email or places for you and your team to go to so that you can make decisions about what you're doing right and what you're doing wrong. So for us, we have a lot more work to do here. I, I would not say we're like exemplar about this, but we do, all of our systems mail us nightly status. So in the morning, or if, if like we often are, we're up you know, at three and four in the morning, we get email from the system and it says, you know, on Orkut, this is how many people signed up. On Facebook, this is how many people signed up. And what we increasingly are trying to do is make that one piece of email give us a very deep sense of everything that's going on and the historical trends so we can take action on it and kind of be done with it and figure out what's going on. So, you know, for, for example, I, I say create nightly email with stats of meaningful things um, where it can promote action, like how many messages were sent or received, how many users installed or uninstalled. Include in that the same data for the last n days, the last n weeks, or the last n months. And the reason to do that is because if you get this piece of email that says, hey, only 200 people signed up today, and all you're seeing is that, you, you, you have to have in your brain, you have to have all the information about, well, how many people signed up yesterday, and how many people signed up last Monday night, or how many people, like, what does this mean historically? So keeping a little bit of historical information in, in your status mail can make a world of difference about, you know, what, what you do. And every one of these status mails that we set up, every, you know, the engineers, myself included, were like, crap, we have to set up a new status mail to figure out what the hell you know, is going on with this. We have to monitor it. We have to do this. It always pays off. It's, it's a really challenging problem to, to get it right, and we're always tweaking it, and I don't think we have it right, but it, it always pays off to make one of those investments in your kind of operational um, view of what's going on uh, with your applications. Um, I also mention here, include correlated statistics about your application. So correlated statistics are, you know, if, if I had some number of users signed up and the number was low, if in that same piece of mail it was showing me a graph that showed that there was an outage that day, I might, that would be, I wouldn't have anything to do. I'm like 90% certain that this was an outage. You know, I don't have anything to do here. Um, trying to squeeze in as many co possibly correlated things such that you can take action on it is good because then you'll spend less time messing with it. You'll spend more time on features. Oh, another, uh, two other things are easy access to server traffic graphs, and I'll show you that in a second, and effective and perceived client rendering time information. Um, effective perceived client rendering time, I'm actually still working on that for us with Open Social because we want to find out how long it's taking, especially in foreign countries, to render our pages. And we want to have a direct kind of dashboard view that shows us in the morning, hey, in India, it's taking on average seven seconds to show the profile box, which is completely unacceptable. But we might not see that. If we, if we try to just look at it from our own testing perspective, I, and we can't go to a third party right now. There's no third party that can you know, analyze open social or Facebook applications and show perceived rendering times right now. So, Maybe there will be someday, but in the meantime, we're going to do some work to capture those analytics. And it's not expensive work. How are we planning on that? How are we planning on um, I'll talk about that. Uh, the question was, how are we planning to do that? The effective perceived um, client. I don't think we're going to get it exactly right, but I think we're going we're to clock a, a certain number of things, and we're going to log it with our server um, in an out-of-band call. And I'll, I'll show you about that, what that is. So this is what I look at all the time. This is one of our traffic graphs, and this is some number of our virtual servers that are running. So I have real time, I can look at a particular server, I can look at the outside view of it, I can look at the inside view of it, I can, um, I can look at bits per second going out of it, I can look at hits per minute, um, I can look at it on a 90 day interval, a seven day interval, a 24 hour interval, a one hour interval. So, and these graphs are just lickety split, I, uh, lickety split they come up instantly for me 
from our tool, which is the Zeus Load Balancer product. Um, I really like this product. I've used a lot of load balancers. This one has a really good um, visualization API built into it, which I think is cool. Um, I think they have a free download, and it runs on any, so any hardware that you want to. So there's a free download version, then, then to use it in production, you need to do, you know, you need to buy the product. Um, but I think it's a really good product. I think it's, it's pretty inexpensive as these goes. And uh, I can tell you it scales to a pretty good size <laughs> so far. But um, one of the things that, that's probably difficult for you to see here, but I'm able to look and say, you know, like, here's an outage of something. Somebody dropped out right there. And I would zoom in on that and see what that was and how long it was and what happened. Um, you might also see, you know, spiky behavior over here is something to, to look at. So um, being able to visualize what your servers are doing, whether or not they're your servers or they're running in the Amazon cloud or they're run, running an app engine. That's one of the things, by the way, I think is really cool about app engine. You know, if you've used it, they have a little console that shows you what's happening, how many 500 errors you served, how many 200, blah, blah, blah. Um, I, I can, knowing Google people <laughs> and how much they monitor their applications, I, I guarantee you that they will think up a lot of different things to view in that dashboard that'll be a lot like what I'm talking about right here. Having that kind of visual view, and maybe it's just me, maybe I'm just a visual person, but to me, having that visual view of what's going on, that just gives you something to act on. So we include graphs like this sometimes in our status mail, and that's something we want to do more of um, for exactly the, the reasons I talked about earlier. So I think traffic graphs are a good thing. Um, in the world of analytics, and we sometimes use database counters. So this is my completely fake um, you know, schema and class in Ruby on Rails that basically counts um, either daily or hourly statistics into the database, and it allows a developer to come in and say, okay, this is, this is something that's happening. Sometimes you have something that's occurring up at the server, and you'd like to count it in this way. Um, in general, we don't use this mechanism for things that are very high volume, like in the hundreds of thousands per hour, because it's a waste of your database to be incrementing counters. Or at least for us, it's an increment. It's, it's a waste of our database to be incrementing counters. And that, that has something to do with all the replication that we have going on, for sure. Um, but there's definitely, like, if you're going to invest in a couple things that are, like, setting yourself up so that your developers have tools that they can, vi they can use to visualize what's going on, this, this would be one of them. We definitely have this in our database. People do use it. We sometimes turn it on for a week for something, and then we, then we analyze the data and we act on it. Um, but we do not have like a huge quantity of analytics going on with this kind of counter in, in our database. So it's definitely useful to a certain degree of scale, but it's, it's, it's just one of the tools in the analytics ar arsenal. Um, just so you know, you know, the way that you use something like this is you, you just basically say stats.increment, and then you name a key, and it just does that for you. And you're able to do pretty simple queries on stuff like this in MySQL if you're a MySQL user. Um, you can name your keys carefully in a hierarchical manner and ask MySQL questions and say, you know, uh, you know select, select sum of value uh, from stats, uh, you know, where name like foo percent um, group by day comma hour. And you would get a roll up of every hit or group, you know, group by just day or whatever you want to do. So we use, we use things like that and very simple MySQL queries to pull out simple stats. Uh, another, another interesting <laughs> way of counting is basically the way that things like uh, QuantServe and, um, and AdSense, to, to some degrees, and, um, and Urchin slash Google Analytics work is hit counters. I've described it as a PHP hit counter because you can actually, on a single page of, of a slide, you can implement roughly everything you need in order to do a PHP hit counter. Um, a, single, a single node running um, light, lighty, light HTTPD, can, can handle, if you configure it correctly, and I gave you sort of the, the reasonable um, configuration, a single node running like this can easily handle this kind of counter tracking for uh, you know, millions upon millions of hits a day without cracking 3% CPU. So it's not, you shouldn't write the same piece of code in Rails. You shouldn't really write the same piece of code in almost anything. 
even PHP on Apache would probably bloat up and, and fall over. But running a very simple script that does something simple, and let me just go through what this says. It basically says, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a, 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 an instance of a web server, Lighty, and I'm going to pump um, I'm going to pump its, its logs out to, to a tool called Chronolog, and Chronolog is going to put it into buckets by day. And you could put it into buckets by hour if you wanted that kind of granularity. If you wanted to do analysis on an hour-by-hour -hour basis, you could do that. Um, and then there's some things about making sure you set the number of file handles and the maximum connections that you can handle concurrently. Those are important to do. Um, and then here's the script. And it, I put in my comments, which basically say, hey, don't you know, there's some things that you'll need to do to HTML entity to code, and really don't do an open redirect relay. That's a bad plan. Um, but the general concept is that if somebody hits this script, you could redirect them to somebody else, and you have a click-through counter. Because what happened was when that hit happened, and this line of code right here that basically says, so if you, if you name this script count.php, and you passed it the parameter um, redirect equals http colon www.ilike.com. This script would set a header location to http www.ilike.com, and it would redirect the browser there, and it would drop in its logs the fact that it had done that redirect. And that is what you just counted. You just dropped a piece of information into a log, and now you can run a log analysis tool and find out how many people redirected to ilike.com. Um, if you're clever, and this is the exercise for the readers, you can pass kind of arbitrary parameters in here and do arbitrary mine log, uh, log mining to find out arbitrarily interesting statistics that you want to about what your site has done. So I, I, I haven't put in here, like, now you have to go mine your Lighty logs, but that is what you do. There's a, there's a plethora of really cool um, uh, open source tools for mining logs and you don't have to be very good at it. It doesn't, doesn't take a lot of hardware to do this. You just chow through a bunch of logs, and you can create cool things. Um, the else clause of this is, basically, if you just want to log a hit, but you don't want to redirect. So for example, um, let's say you would like to, um, what's, a, what's a good example of this? The lights are so bright, I, my, my mind is numb. Um, if you just wanted to log that some action occurred on a page, like that somebody popped open a, uh, a particular chooser box. So you want to find out how many people are popping open this damn chooser box. Okay? So somewhere in your system, maybe you count how many times you send this page down, or you have it from Google Analytics. You've decided, I'm very interested in this page. And you find out that you get a million people viewing this page a day. But now you want to find out that you're putting this new UI, UI element on it, and it's a chooser of some kind. First, they have to click on it, and then they have to send. So what's going to happen? Well, your logs might show you how many people send, but you're wondering how many people are opening it, how many people are, how many people are given the choice, and how many people then convert all the way through to sending whatever it is. So what you might do is, on the JavaScript code that pops this thing open, you might fire a little Ajax uh, request up to this script, and it would just log something, and it would put in cache control, no cache, pragma, no cache, content type, text plane, and it would just say OK. It would just be done. So all that would happen from your AJAX request from the client would be to tickle this counter. Then what you would have in your logs is you could combine your Google Analytics information, the number of people who opened this UI element, and you'd find the number of people who actually did it, and you could perform a conversion analysis to see you know, how well you're doing with that particular feature. And then you do some other things, which I'll talk about in a second, to, to take action on it. Um, another thing that you can do in this same realm is you can put image trackers around, which is basically how uh, Google Urchin tags work, is they basically, there's a little function. And this is an almost functional function. You can debug it yourself, which is you know, if you have something you want to track, um, you create a one-by-one -one GIF somewhere in your world that you deliver with no caching and no, no anything on it. And um, you, force the, you force the browser to create a new image object, and you append some parameters onto it, including, um, including a cache buster. And you put an onload event on it. And some browsers like it when you have an onload event. Basically, a, if you create an object with an onload event on it, 
then it, it causes it to run. Um, otherwise, it will defer until you mount the object onto a, a DOM element to do it. So this little thing is actually, this little patch of code, you could, you'd have to tweak it a little bit, but it basically um, uses one by one tracking just to, to also do the same thing, to register reports in a log that you can then mine later and find out what to do. So this is what we do with this kind of thing. So we, we visualize what's going on with clicks, um, click through sometimes, clicks on things, clicks on user interface elements, impressions of elements, number of people that have viewed things. So we do all sorts of things mining this kind of log. Um, and you know, it, it may seem like I'm on, I'm like, well, why are you talking about analytics? We're, we're talking about kind of scaling. <laughs> it, in my mind, the two things are completely related because scaling, in order to scale, you need users. And in order to get users, you need to have analytics. And in order to scale, you also need to perform well. And in order to perform well, you need analytics. And in order to, to debug well, you know, you need analytics. And in order to make product choices, I think you, you need to have analytics. So that's why I always, or we try to start with analytics. Um, so this is just an example. We happen to find, so we mine a bunch of, of stuff. We store data in um, RRD format, which is a format open source library that writes historical uh, data into a, a very compact representation on disk. We don't use a data, we don't use a MySQL database for it. We use thousands and millions of little tiny RRD files to, to track this information. Um, we happen to visualize this data with a SWIFT, a free flash SWIFT that we found on the web that's good at charting things. But I think increasingly, um, the Google data visualization APIs are gonna be the way to go. They're gonna have a bunch of SWIFT objects that visualize data like really, really well. So I'm looking forward to using those to project our data onto. And I gave you this one example. Um, in, in reality, we often take multiple pieces of data and we fold them together to see how things are comparing um, and, and see what, exactly what they're doing. So the question, <laughs> the question is what to track. Um, and, and the answer is really much anything. How users install, how they uninstall, how they invite each other, um, how they convert from one page to another, how they convert from one UI action to another, what they click on, what they don't click on, if you can. There's a lot of things in Google Analytics that are very good at answering these questions for you, but um, d there's plenty more that you can do that's, that's relevant to building um, applications, especially in the social environment. I, I mean, we were always very into analytics at, at I like, but even more so once we got on the social networks and we were trying to understand what the workflow pattern was and like how do people invite their friends to do things and how do people prefer to be notified about things. It's, it's, these are, you know, and, and what makes people more likely to do, to do something. Um, it's very, 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 very unique in, in that space to have so many people flowing through it. So I, my example here is, um, these are activity stream events that we fire into Orkut, where we say, um, you know, Brendan Ribera added the arcade fire to their artist I like, and then Orkut appends this part at the end that says via music I like. Um, and then we put a picture, and then we say add music to your profile. Um, in terms of what we would test with this is literally everything in this. The size of the image, does the size of the image make people more likely to install or not? Does the text of, of this make them more likely to install or not? Does you know, having, having add music to your profile or not help or does it not help? Does showing pictures of your friends or not help you or not help you? So all of those things are, are very interesting. Sometimes, and the reason I went through so many crazy examples of ways to collect data is, unfortunately, it's not one size fits all. Like, we're not the people rendering this piece of content. We gave some HTML, XML content to Orkut as an activity stream, and they render this content. Not only that, we, we can't give them a one-by-one one pixel or some JavaScript to render there. We, in, in fact, right now, we can't even give them a uh, we can't give them a click-through URL right now. That's something we've asked them for, but they're still working on how URLs will work inside of activity streams. So, you know, how are we actually going to monitor this piece and see how it performs? Well, the main way we're going to monitor how this particular piece performs right now is we're going to do, I, I'm not sure if I put this on the next page or not. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, yeah, no, I did put it on this way. Um, is what, what, what I call 
um, day A, day B testing as opposed to A, B testing. So A, B testing is when you, if you have a, a thousand pages that you're spewing out, you make 500 of them look one way and 500 of them look another way, and that's your A and that's your B, and you see how many from each of those groups, A and B, get to what you're trying to do or how, how, how many of them do whatever it is you're trying to measure. Sometimes you don't have the ability, like in this ORCID case, to do an A and a B. You can't do an A and a B simultaneously, so you have to do day A, day B testing, and on day A, the notifications you send might look like this, or you might run it for a week. And then on day B or week B, you run a completely different level. And then you try to see if there's a difference in how many people install um, from, from those two places. So that's a really quick one, run through of, of both scaling and analytics. Um, I, think, <laughs> I think there's an awful lot of, of tools here at this, at this conference that Google has done that, um, that I would encourage everyone to take a look at. I mentioned the data visualization APIs. I mentioned the, um, um, I mentioned the uh, uh, App Engine, um, Google Analytics. So I think those are all really worthwhile for anyone who's interested in this area to take a look at. The open social um, developer mailing lists are a pretty good place. Um, I think people are afraid sometimes to ask performance questions like, hey, I'm having this problem. But there's really a lot of people who are willing to help and, w and willing to chime in with advice or, or snippets of code. So um, if you're not using that resource, you should, you should definitely consider doing so. Um, so with that, it was, it was a really fast breeze through. And anything at all that interested you from, from start to finish, um, I'd like to ask you to just ask a question. And I'll repeat your questions. I think we're being videotaped in some, some way. Right here. The, the question was, are we using Mongrel for the application server? And the answer is yes. We, we use Mongrel. Uh, the question is, is, is there a bottleneck with Mongrel for us, or is there not? Um, we've made some special modifications to, rail, uh, to Mongrels. We've, we've made a, um, we do memory allocation a little bit differently in Rails. We, do, um, we don't do um, kind of multiplicative expanding heaps because whole heaps get locked in RAM. So we don't do that. In Mongrel, we implemented a pre-fork capability in Mongrel. So Mongrel sh ends up sharing about 100 meg of working set between the Mongrels. Um, but Rails, in general, does need more restarts than, say, PH, you know, classic fast CGI PHP or Zen PHP. Um, but you know, we're pretty happy. We're pretty happy with Rails. Is, there's no particular bottleneck with, with Rails. Um, it's a good question. We are evaluating right now um, the Ubuntu, is it called Fusion Passenger? I don't even remember. Um, which is a, basically it's a mod Rails pat, uh, a plugin for, for Apache. Um, and that also has something of a pre-fork capability. And we're testing that out. We, we, we've put it into production um, several times, and it's knocked itself out. But we're, we're going to keep plugging at it. Yeah, we, we love it. We, we, we try everything. We're total. You know, we're performance junkies. We we want to, and we're we don't want to have a big data center. Actually, that that was the humorous part of the, the keynote speech. Is <laughs> is you know, do you have your own cloud? Right? We don't have our own cloud. We have this little mini puffy cotton ball, um, and we really don't want a cloud because that's not our core competency. Our core competency. I mean, we're really good at scaling. I think, but but we want our core competency to be. Um, making our app feel like a native part of every open social application it's in, not like a jacked on, plugged on, bolted on thing, but really using that open social, um, you know, using open social so we run right out of the box easily, but then using our skill in DHTML and in styling to really fit in nicely. That's what we really want to do. That's kind of our core competency. And so in as much as we can get out of the cloud business, we, we definitely like to do that. Yet at the same time, we really do enjoy kind of getting 100,000 hits a minute or 200,000 hits a minute sometimes. Um, right over here, yeah. Now, you said that you were starting from scratch to uh, spend more time with the client side rather than the testing. Can you talk about those skills and how you use Yeah. So the, the, um, the question was, if we, if we were starting from scratch, I mentioned that we might choose to use more uh, client-side template expansion and, 
and kind of data calls and JSON and, and maybe jQuery stuff to get data from the server um, and to, to speak to how we might do that or what technologies. Um, because we don't do that, I don't think I'm the best resource in the world um, to answer the question. Um, but the, the little bit of work, or looking at rather, that I've done um, with Google's template library, and I forget the name of it, but Google has, yeah, it's, trim, it's TrimPath, but there's another piece of it too. Yeah, I think it's just called TrimPath. Um, um, I think that's pretty interesting. It also has some other capabilities if you combine it with localization, where if you include your templates in your module spec for your gadget, which would make our gadget pretty big, but I mean, it would still, it's cache, so it would probably be a good thing. But if, you're, if your localization was applied there on the client, that would be a pretty cool way to get kind of localization and template expansion and less moving over the wire um, at, the, at the same time. Yeah, I really, um, but I don't know other ones. I, I would encourage you to ask that question of the, of the list. I, having spoken with the open social engineering team, and brought up the fact that you know this programming model, this paradigm seems a little more compatible with client-side um, templates than it does with server-side in terms of the size of the, the data cache and, and, and latency issues and so forth. Um, they said, yeah, we, we want to work harder on templates. Let's all get together and really make it a stronger feature for, for open social. So I would, I would encourage you to jump in um, uh, and, and check that out. Did I see a hand over here? Right here. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The the question was um, was I mentioned um, trying to track client rendering time and what do I think about using a tool a, like a CDN management tool of some kind to to track that? Um, I haven't had much. I, I I think it would be great. I mean, so the the, the short answer is I think that would be good. The um, there are, there are tools that I've used in the past in a previous life that were monitoring like latency of clips or latency of movie start times and stuff like that that came out of the CDNs. And I think those, those were great products because you would get a daily report of latency throughout the day that showed you exactly what everything was doing. The problem with our apps and app monitoring though is that inside of open social and inside of Facebook, there's, there's this whole concept of being logged in and, and <laughs> And there's a bunch of iframes, and it's not exactly, and there's OAuth happening, so it's not it's not as compatible with what's really going on. So as of yet, I haven't I haven't met an external monitoring service that could give me the results that I wanted. I can simulate a little bit by sneaking in and grabbing an iframe of some kind and finding out what that latency is, um, but as of yet, I haven't found that. Um, I realized somebody had asked that question sort of earlier as well, and I didn't I didn't answer it super concretely. Um, the example that I gave of an Ajax call up that is a that was a kind of a, a item potent call that just says whoop, you know, count this into your logs. That's a great example of what I would use and what I plan to use for collecting some data in my JavaScript as as the page loads, as my JavaScript starts to run, and as I get to the end of it, of what's happening, I'm going to make this call up to the server to trigger a log entry that says, you know, here's the IP address. It was from Brazil. You know, um, it took this many seconds to do this. It took this many seconds to do this. And I'll probably put in some kind of random counter that says one out of every, you know, thousand hits log this information. And then I'll collect some data in real time, relative real time up on the server that shows me what these stats are and I'll graph them and then, you know, we'll work on it if, if, if that shows bad stuff happening. Um, if somebody else came with a cost-effective product that did that for me without me having to do it, <laughs> I would probably, I would, I would look very carefully at the price. But when I, when I think of, of what it would take me to just add another type of statistics collection to my log, I, I would probably, I, I might, you know, it would take quite a low price for me to, to consider not just doing that particular one myself. Um, but that's a good question. Lots of people snuck in at the end. Hi. <laughs> um, there was a question at the back. I didn't miss anybody, did I? Oh, actually, let me let me ask this person right here first. I think he was first. Yeah. 
ah, uh, you know, it's not too horrible. Um, um, so, you know, Active Record doesn't mind if you jam attributes onto it after the fact. So, um, as far as the consumer is concerned, the person doing the original call that thinks that they're doing some really complex join, you know, they get back a set of Active Record objects and they have all the attributes they expect them to have. Um, so, th the way we, we have somewhat and architecturally how we're supposed to in what we do is that the, the, the wrapping layer, sh or the, I'm sorry, the cache layer should be a different model. Just like a view in the database, you, if you have a view in active record, if, you're, if your database has, you know, uh, a, a, a table called foo and another table called bar, and then it has a complex join, you know, faz, that's a representation of foo and bar, you should have an active record model for faz. So, in exactly the same way, if you have a, you know, cached in-memory joined FAS, you should have a model called either FAS, you can, if, if that's the only way you use it, you should have it that way, or you should have cached in-memory <laughs> FAS that acts just like a, the active record object should. So what we tend to do is, um, you know, stuff, stuff attributes right into the attributes um, if we get them from an alternate source. If, I mean, it sounds like you know active record, so, uh, um, you know, very specifically, we, we literally go do a search by ID and get a full active record object of, let's say in this case, the foo and the bar. We get a foo and we get a bar, and then we pull the attributes out of them and we shove them into the FAS. And that's pretty much what we do. Um, yeah. Let's see, there was somebody at, at the back. Oh, hi, sorry. Yeah, the, the question was, um, um, are we on two different code bases for open social and, and uh, Facebook, and are we, are we waiting for the RESTful API to, to kind of consolidate things? Um, the answer is that, um, is that I would call it 90% common code because it's model view controller, and the only thing that we're talking about that's fundamentally different is really the view. And in the open social world, we have a, a larger amount of the logic that um, embodies certain kinds of actions lives down in JavaScript. Um, Rails, in, in our world, Rails has a representation of how you deal with that. We don't entirely agree with it, so we're, we're a little bit harder core JavaScript programmers ourselves, so we, we happen to do it our own way, and we call up to our services um, in, our, in a client-side RESTful way. Um, the RESTful API is going to be nice. <laughs> um, the RESTful API is definitely a piece of feedback we really wanted very early on. We're like, hey, in Facebook, this is how classic web developers understand how to program. And we, we all understand the, the client-side templates, and wow, we really see the benefits, but we're just not, you know, we're not ready to, to do all of that. Can we, can we get the RESTful API so that we can do things like fill in user photos up on the server and cache them up on the server. And, you know, we believe that we will generate better, more responsive content that way than, um, based on our knowledge of, of how to do that, than um, doing it completely down on the client. We have done plenty of stuff on the client, like when um, that, that example that was up during the keynote, which was about um, projecting Ingrid Michelson's, uh, projecting I like content onto Ingrid Michelson's site, um, that piece of code, when it's rendering these walls, it, it, all it has is open social friend connect user IDs, and it doesn't know what their, what their user photo is. So it has to, that content has to get down, and then the JavaScript has to wander through and pick up these IDs and then go make a query to the open social server and pick up those photos and profile URLs. And it's noticeable. When the page renders, you notice that that happens. So um, the RESTful stuff will, will clean that up in two ways. It'll, it won't have this DOM walking code in the client, and it will also make our server a little bit more consistent with how we cache things. So it will definitely make life a little easier, but the, I mean, the core question, the, the core piece is, um, is open social 
uh, open social apps are really just a projection, uh, a view projection, you know, and there's some JavaScript going on. So I think it's a, I mean, I think it's a relatively easy thing to get your head around. Um, what can be challenging is how to interact with things like generating an activity stream that then returns, you know, and creates a full cycle. Like our dedication feature is pretty complicated to do because the actual dedication has to get sent from the client to the server, but at the same time, we want to represent that a dedication was sent in our databases. So there's an interesting race situation there where one or the other might fail, and we just have to deal with a lot of edge cases associated with that. So the RESTful server will help a lot with that. Um, we're, we're, we're definitely looking forward to, to that aspect, but it may be that all, not all open social containers will, will pick that up. Um, I've got two more minutes, and they're gonna, they're gonna hold me to the time. I meant to, I meant to mention, oh, it's too late to, to mention that lunch was extended, so you're all hungry. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, does anyone else have any other questions? These people are probably not even here to listen to me. There's some more interesting talk coming next in this room. Um, right over there. On Google Analytics? Um, I, I'm not sure I understand the question. So it was, it was how, how do like namespace changes impact what we do? Yep. 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 We're pretty careful about that. I mean, that's part of, of getting onto Rails is this mindset that you hop on, which is, I believe in RESTful URLs, and I will not pass crazy IDs around. And um, I think it's a pretty cool, you know, it's, it's one of those things where some people are like, my, you know, my hand is tied to my waist, and I can't change stuff enough. And I'm like, yeah, your hand's tied to your waist, but you're, you know, you're in a car instead of walking. You know, so you're getting where you're trying to go. So let's just go there. Um, we try not to change the namespace all that much. Um, for, for that reason, but for us, there's just the whole other restful set of reasons. Like, you know, we're at bug 6,000 in the database, and if I go back to bug one, um, I can still find an URL in there that works. That, that where somebody says, this page was broken for the following reason, I can go back and click on that URL and, and see if it's regressed or not. So I, I'm, I'm pretty anal about, about URLs, I think it would be safe to say. Um, but yeah, you know, that is a problem. You, you should be very wary of namespace changes, and you should put more thought than you think of into what your initial namespace, <laughs> namespace is. It's, it's always, worth, always worth the effort, all those early namespace arguments. Yeah, right here. I think they're gonna post the slides. Yeah, oop, my time is completely out. Um, I'll be here for a couple more minutes. Um, thank you very much. I, I hope this uh, met your needs and have fun at the rest of the conference. Thanks.